Good afternoon, London. Uh, this session is a bit different because I am currently sitting in New York at our New York office of WSO2. Unfortunately, I couldn't make it to London this time. I was planning to come there. I was looking forward to coming there. One, for the conference and meeting all of you. Two, because I'm an Arsenal fan. I'm drinking tea from my Arsenal cup. And fortunately, our team is doing well this year. Anyways, what's done is done. I'm in New York, you are in London, and let's try to do this session. So pr currently, uh, you would have experience and you would have the knowledge of two sessions during this track. Aziz would have spoken to you about implementation of the cell-based reference architecture, the concepts that Asanka presented in his keynote in the morning half of the day. Following that, Chatura would have spoken to you about reactive applications and building those applications using the concepts of APIs, streams, and events. So this session is about decentralized data. So why data? Again, we had a lot of sessions and we will be having a lot of sessions focusing on services, focusing on how services translate to a microservices architecture. But there aren't too many sessions on basically how you would translate traditional data into microdata architectures. Right? So that's, that's the focus of this session. So we speak about decentralized data, decentralized data architectures, but we also map that to microdata and how data can be used in a microservices architecture. Uh, so, so to start things off, basically, let's look at the agenda, right? So what we're gonna to do today is we are gonna look at uh, the centralized data architecture nature. Again, we're not going to go into this in too much details. All of us grew up going to computer science classes where we spoke about the importance of database management systems and why it's important, so on and so forth, right? So, so we will just uh, relate to that a bit. Right? Following that, we'll basically talk about the journey towards decentralization and microservices. We will talk about how to break up our centralized data structures into business domains, into transactions, into basically a model where you can translate your data and come up with a decentralized data model. Uh, we'll talk about what the concept of a transaction boundary is. We'll talk about some of the fast data concepts, including data caching, uh, the concepts of microdata or data that's closer to the actual service. Uh, we will talk about streaming data as well. And, and persistence of streaming data, uh, a newer concept coming up, and, and we'll basically summarize uh, everything towards the end. All right. Okay, so centralized data principles. Again, this diagram on the right for you, or the left for you, must be inverse. Yeah. Uh, it's basically a diagram which shows the evolution of database management systems, the evolution of data uh, as well, from the 1960s when the term was actually coined to the basically the 70s and 80s when Oracle really took off uh, and, and basically IBM DB2 etc towards the modern era where you have different types of data technologies different big data technologies different fast data technologies etc uh, but but if you basically go through this and, and again I've, I've just put a snapshot of that diagram it's not the whole diagram if you go through this, there are still important concepts. Right? So the ACID concepts, atomicity, consistency of data, durability and isolation. Um, centralized databases provide you with this single place to manage and look up data. Uh, centralized databases gives you this mutable view, a global view across uh, all of your services, across uh, all of your environments. A single point of enforcement of, of let's say security of privacy etc a simpler management of technology like if you need to do high availability or if you need to set your organizational availability for data it's a single location that you can look at so on and so forth right? so centralized data has a lot of principles that are very important uh, that need to be looked at when you are looking at a decentralized or micro data approach right? Uh, if you so, so there have been a lot of research going on in this area, a lot of surveys going on in this area, and, and and a lot of data architects and a lot of digital transformation architects talk about a number of critical factors when it comes to databases. 
performance being a key factor. Uh, so we are looking at data technologies that have higher performance that are maybe closer to the services so that are faster. Uh, performance comes in the mode of write performance versus read performance as well. That's where NoSQL basically made a breakthrough. Availability, again, uh, is, is an important concept. Consistency is an important concept. So there are technologies such as uh, the RDS from AWS, etc., uh, basically that provides you availability across multiple zones, multiple regions, etc. And then, of course, the ACID principles. Right? So there have, there have been different types of data stores, data sources over time. RDBMS being the prevalent uh, data technology, uh, most of our applications, most of our projects and technology are based on RDBMS even today. Right? Uh, there have been research that shows that more than 60% of, of current technology projects are based on uh, any some sort of RDBMS. NoSQL did make a breakthrough. I mentioned some of the reasons before, uh, but again, RDBMS is still the prevalent technology. There are technologies like GraphDB, graph databases for much more complex data structures. Uh, Neo4j is one of those examples, uh, etc. So data technology has basically been moving from the time, from the inception of, of data itself. Uh, basically, there have been different ways of managing this technology. And we will see more and more newer technology areas coming up to manage this technology, right, to manage the data. So, so basically, let, let me take an example. Uh, so this diagram shows a, a simple RESTful set of APIs that are backed by a centralized data store. It's right? simple enough. Uh, I'm, I'm taking a ride sharing platform as an example. So you can see at the top of the diagram, you see the ride pla sharing platform UI. So that, so that can be, let's say, a single page application. Uh, it can be a mobile application. Uh, there is a middleware layer. Uh, let's consider that a center of excellence, so a centralized middleware layer, uh, which has an API gateway as well. So from this API gateway, this project basically exposes a bunch of REST APIs, right? So I'm just showing two REST APIs here. In the back end, uh, there is a centralized database. So, so with maybe multiple schemas or, or multiple databases uh, within it, whatever technology you're using. Uh, so, so we have a number of databases for let's say drivers, riders, registrations, etc. So the database has a lot of principles, a lot of advantages there. It's a global database. It has mutable values. Uh, it's a shared database which can be highly available. It has the ACID properties in place. Uh, it's relatively simple to manage, etc. And this is basically a, a, a typical project that one would see uh, in, implemented in many organizations, right? Even for organizations who are moving towards RESTful services or a much more microservices oriented architecture, you would still see uh, legacy data systems which have like massive Oracle clusters or IBM DB2 clusters or, or maybe MS SQL database servers, etc. Right? So single servers or, or larger, uh, like larger chunks of database servers. Right? So how would you move basically from that structure to data in a microservices world? Right? So again, as I mentioned, we've seen in the past or in the present that more than 60% of the projects use a traditional relational database management system. Uh, in, in some of the recent surveys done by like certain organizations, nine out of 10 architects figure that data or database management is one of the key components in digital transformation. It's a critical component to digital transformation. But at the same time, if you're going to a true microservices world, it doesn't help for to basically just share that database across different services, right? Because that, that means you'd run into conflicts. You'd run into uh, like uh, competing read-write operations, you, you'd, you'd run into like data model conflicts, you'd, you'd run into coordination challenges there, etc. Right? But at the same time, you need to figure out like how you would apply those principles, the, the data management principles, like the ACID principles, uh, like a, a single location to look at, etc. How you would 
you would basically assign those safeties that basically came to us due to the fact that we're using an RDBMS into the whole microservices world as well. Right? So that's that's basically the problem. So that's that's what we are trying to get at today. So let's just relook at why microservices. There'll be again, as I mentioned, there have been sessions on microservices. There will be sessions on on microservices. So I'm not going to go into the details of microservices and why you need them. But I'm I'm just going to touch upon certain concepts that are relevant to data. Right. So so one teams working independently right, at, at different speeds. So some agile, some some basically traditional waterfall, some waterfall agile or agile, etc. Uh, different technology stacks. Right? So, so basically, some microservices using, let's say, uh, Spring Boot. Some using Ballerina. Basically, some using Node Node for J, etc. Uh, no dependencies. So, so you want to build you know, microservices. Your teams want to independently build microservices, but they don't want to be dependent on other teams, right? Uh, they don't want to affect other teams as well. So you make a schema change. You don't want to basically go affect uh, the two other teams that are reliant on that same service. Um, autonomous decisions on design, on methodology, on technology. So I want to decide whether I can be agile. I want to decide when I can uh, build these applications, launch them. I want to decide what database technology I need to use. And I should be able to react to business requirements independently. So there are a few, micro, uh, few driving factors for microservices and that in turn basically translates into my data layer as well. So we know this microservice data architecture mantra, right? So if you've looked at Martin Fowler's uh, steps for a microservice, the definition of a microservice or many other definitions out there, this is quite uh, similar, right? So each microservice controls its own data source or database and multiple services cannot share a database right so that's that's basically a, a guiding principle for microservices uh, so we've come across that uh, and and we basically also know that there are certain patterns associated with that so there is the whole publisher subscriber pattern or event driven architecture pattern which we'll we'll touch upon in a bit there is the whole single data source per microservice pattern uh, which which is basically what this uh, statement mentions as well. There is the CQRS pattern or the command query response segmentation pattern which separates like read write databases etc. And so there are certain patterns but in essence the the concept that we're trying to stick to is one microservice one uh, database. Right? So there are multiple steps and I've listed a few steps here uh, on our journey towards data decentralization. So we have the central database, right? So we have, so we'll call it a legacy database today, uh, and we want to basically move from that central database to uh, a decentralized set of databases or data technologies or data sources, whatever we want to call them and whatever we want to use there as well. All right. So step number one: identify business domains. So you remember our ride-sharing application. You remember our, a set of REST APIs that we had there. Uh, a centralized physical database that we had there, which included multiple schemas or databases, whatever we want to call them. All right. Uh, so, so my first step here is so we let's let's identify the business domain. So, in a ride sharing application, we've identified that there is rides, which are basically the the riders and the drivers participating in a single ride. Right. So, I'll call that rides. Maybe there's a registration process where drivers register independently, where riders register independently. All right. So my first step is basically I have a database called rides, which is simple enough. I have a service called rides. I have a RESTful API on top of that. So that can be a simple enough microservice. Secondly, I'm, I've identified a RESTful API for registration. There's a service called registration. But that registration database refers to drivers as well as riders, right? So, so it's an aggregated service of sorts. So when, you, when we come to the section on transactions, this may be a scenario where a transaction might be required or not, okay? But in, the, in, this, can, in this scenario, I've identified my business domain. I'm identifying my boundaries as well. And now I'm, I've identified that 
driver registration and rider registration can happen relatively independently right so i've got now if you look move down the diagram i've got a driver registration service which can be a microservice which has its own restful api and a rider registration service which has its own restful api as well okay so we've done that step one and two right step three basically understand transactions and their boundaries so we identified the domain we identified basically the the transactions so now we want to basically identify the boundaries of those transactions right so so if you look at the diagram above again i have th my same set of services i have rides i have driver registration i have rider registration i have the three databases right but i understand that to provide rides as a service i need driver registration and rider registration information right so what I've shown here is with these purple arrows, information from drivers and information from riders are going into the rides table or the rides database. Right? This can be via services, this can be via like database calls. I'm just showing you the logical diagram here. Right? So rides is being updated in some manner using the source of truth from drivers and riders. Um, I'm going a step further in the diagram below. And if you look at point number four, identify microservices and transactions that cross boundaries, but at the same time design for failure. So one of the important driving principles here is that one, you have to design for failure. You have to assume that the other service that is talking to you or the other service that you are calling will not have the same state as you have, right? Will not be updated uh, as much as you have. So that's, that's one of the concepts or one of the guiding principles that you need to keep in mind. So in this diagram below, if you see, I've got the same set of services, rides, driver registration and rider registration, but I'm doing multiple things there. So if you look at the, the right-hand part of this, right? So you can see under riders as the database, I've identified riders as a source of truth, right? So this is a scenario where driver registration also needs rider information for example and so because of that reason you need to keep a copy of that data in the driver's database as well right so there might be a requirement for that depending on how fast data needs to be accessed and then you cannot go across domain to pick a microservice each and every time if there is a requirement as such one pattern is to basically identify a source of truth and basically update a copy on the other databases, but ensure that at any given time, all the services know that this is just a copy of that data and the actual source of truth is in a certain database. So in this case, the rider database. Similarly, another pattern here is the pattern I mentioned as CQRS. Right? So command query response segmentation. CQRS focuses on basically splitting data into like read and write operations. So if you look at the riders registration service, uh, there, is, there is basically a write operation where you call a REST API that basically writes to the riders table and that may be copying it to other tables or, or basically uh, ma making it eventually consistent. But at the same time, I'm going to create a read copy so that read only operations can happen really fast, uh, basically using another microservice. And this is quite common in internet-based applications, like let's say if you have a, a Twitter kind of application, there are more reads than writes. Right? So, so you need you need like CQRS patterns quite often uh, when it comes to like microservices or date, microdata. Okay, so that, that basically brings us to this diagram and some detailed design guidelines. So let's just go through them. So we touched on some of them, but eventual consistency is key in any microdata architecture which means you basically can start updating certain data you cannot expect all of the data to be at the at consistent state at like any given time or at the same time but they will eventually be consistent at, at that point in time you need to look at your design and you need to figure out what are the consistency requirements and whether there are specific sources that need to be consistent at a higher rate or consistent faster than other systems. Using domain-driven design basically allows you to figure out 
uh, like what the services should be, what the API should be, what the RESTful API should be, and in turn, what the actual data store should be. So we need to ensure that you only store data locally where it is required and when it is required, and you don't store more than what is required. So it's a bit different from how you traditionally model databases. Using an event-driven architecture where possible, so you basically publish changes to the model. So let's say you, in this scenario, let's say a driver is registered in this MSSQL database, right? That basically publishes certain information to an event bus or event queue or Kafka queue, whatever. And, and there are there is a mechanism where these other data sources who are interested can subscribe to that information, fetch that information and update their model. Right? So using event-driven architectures, you, uh, you can use a, like a, a pub sub pattern as well to provide eventual consistency. But at the same time, you need to ensure that services aren't too chatty. So if you realize that rides have to call the driver registration each and every call, that means there might be a chance you can redesign your services. So, so we looked at that. Another interesting point uh, though uh, that is coming up now is this concept of streaming data as your persistent data store. So in this scenario, and then and, and that's where if you look at the last bullet point there, I'm, I'm talking about concepts like Kafka, Apache Samza from, from LinkedIn, uh, the WC2 stream processor as well as part of an overall solution. So this concept here is that you don't rely on databases because database is supposed to be a source of truth and the database is supposed to be the whole truth at that given time. Yes, there is eventual consistency, but the database is supposed to hold all of the information, historical information, current information, etc. With streaming data, with the use of events and streams, in, in this case, you have a bunch of data that is coming in continuously. You have events and streams of e streams coming in you, uh, using your, your event mechanism and your event-driven architecture. So in this case, data storage is just, or simply put, the persistence of that streaming data at, at a given point in time. Right? So you have a stream of events coming in, and you basically decide that you want to persist that data. And that's basically your data storage or data persistence. We do that today as well, right? So if you look at WSO2 stream processor projects, you basically, let's say, have a, a, a stream of credit card data coming in. At some point, you decide that you need to have a Lambda architecture where you handle real-time data, uh, process that real-time data, and persist it in a different format. You have batch, uh, you have raw data, and then you decide like there's a certain type of raw data that you want to store uh, and persist in a different format. Right? So, so basically, Taking that step, that concept one step further is basically the, the concept of streaming data as your persistent data store, right? So this, this would allow you to replay data at any time as well uh, for debugging purposes, for migration purposes as well. You just migrate to your newer system and you just replay all of the data, which, which can help. Uh, you, you can basically switch your underlying data persistence technology as required, etc. It's a radical concept. It doesn't work for everyone, but it is one of those newer concepts out there. So pros and cons of a micro data architecture. Right? So of course, advantages, we, we've seen that. So very resilient systems, very highly available, fault tolerant. You have your independence. Uh, you basically can build microservices in a very independent manner. This concept of polyglot persistence, right? Use whatever persistence technology that suits your need. Uh, designed for failures, of course. So, so if your if your database server goes down, right, it's just one microservices cluster or one microservice that's affected. If you have like a micro database per microservice, you will have different resilient services also that can do the same task. Avoiding complex transactions across boundaries. So your your massive inner joints, your massive complex joints, etc., etc. Uh, your views across multiple schemas, etc., goes away. Uh, so you design for simplicity, you design for internet scale, you define, design for uh, avoiding complex transactions. Of course, the disadvantages would mean it's very complex to operationalize, it's very complex to basically take uh, to an operational state. You cannot guarantee consistency, so that's a key business disadvantage. If there's a business requirement to have consistency across the board at any given time across any service, 
then you're going to face challenges, right? So, so that's something you need to consider as part of your design. And then, of course, it, debugging is, is really complex. So that brings me to my summary slide. This, this architecture here shows uh, what, would, what a decentralized data architecture would look like. Again, just one, one view of it, right? So if you look at the points as well that I mentioned there, what I mentioned again is since the data sources are independent, you can select your persistence layer and that would depend on your requirement. So that can be some type of RDBMS and each team can have their own RDBMS. It can be like NoSQL storages, it can be a graph databases, it can be cached data as well. Right? Uh, it can be like a micro data lake, etc. If, uh, and then, then I've mentioned you can introduce caching and indexing as needed. Uh, you can talk about the concept of micro data lakes, etc. So if you look at this diagram, if I go from the bottom up, uh, you can see there's the event bus at the bottom, which is key. Uh, you, there is one set of RESTful APIs, which basically has a memcache deployment. So it's, it's reading from cache. The microservice is reading from cache, and there are RESTful API gateways or micro gateways deployed that, that expose micro APIs. Similarly, so that's a publisher subscriber model. Uh, the, so there is, there is basically, oh, I'll switch that around so it should be pub and sub. Uh, so th th in this scenario, there is a MySQL database, maybe running on AWS, RDS, for instance, which publishes information to the event bus and, and that is subscribed to by Memcache. So there's eventual consistency there. There is a micro data lake as well. So th there's a concept of data lakes. Uh, so where you basically have raw data which can be used for different purposes. You can use that same concept and have a micro data lake which has a, a, a minimal set of micro raw data which may be going through kind of like a Hadoop process or, or some kind of a MapReduce process uh, from your, your main data storage to create your micro data lake. Right? So that's, that's one option. Uh, you, you basically can have databases which are real-time consistent databases which are eventually consistent you can have different speeds of that data again depending on the microservices requirement caching plays a huge role indexing plays a huge role and i've shown one example here which maybe uses stream processing so instead of using traditional databases this microservice would use stream processing uh, maybe apache samza or, or kafka or ws with a stream processor to basically have data because that, that's the nature of the service in that case. Okay. So that's basically my phone going off. Uh, so I, I, I set the timer on the phone as well. Let me switch that off. All right. Okay. So that basically brings me to the end of my slide deck. And uh, it was, again, pleasure talking to you. Uh, it's, it's basically uh, the weather's good in New York. I hope, I hope it's good in London as well. And I hope you enjoy the networking session. If you have any questions, again, your event hosts there can basically help you with that. And of course, I'll be around uh, on email uh, to answer your questions. Thank you. Have a good day.